A reenactment of the December 23rd night skirmish between the United States and the British who had just landed in Louisiana as part of their invasion to take New Orleans. Uh, the battle took part at night uh, when Andrew Jackson learned in New Orleans that the British had landed. He yelled out, by the eternal, they shall not sleep on our soil. He then he launched an immediate attack against the British who were just landing in uh, off of Bayou B Avenue. Uh, in what's now uh, the area where the Murrow refinery is today. Uh, it was a not an organized attack, but basically uh, the Americans just came in to try to unsettle the British. The battle itself was a draw. There was a lot of confusion. It was fought at night. didn't have any lights, so you ended up having friendly fire t being taken on both sides. Uh, but it knocked the British off balance and bought the Americans precious time to build defenses uh, along the way where the Americans made their big stand on January 8th, 1815 uh, near the site of the Chalmette Plantation, which is where the battlefield of the Battle of New Orleans. The War of 1812 is often called the Forgotten War. Most Americans don't realize, but our capital was not only captured by an invading force, but it was burned. One of the reasons why the White House is called the White House was that it was painted to cover the burn scars from, uh, from the British attack and burning at the capital. Uh, the War of 1812 also helped sow the seeds of the friendship between the United States and the United Kingdom. That's a friendship that has lasted throughout world wars and, and exists to this day in our war against terror. I think it's important to uh, reenact the battle every year because otherwise people do tend to forget. And it's, it's amazing how uh, people seem to ignore the War of 1812. It's very rightly called the Forgotten War by many people. And really, it is so important. It's the war, I think, that gave the United States a true national character. It was the beginning of the idea of the United States as a single entity, rather than these United States, which was the original idea, where most people thought of themselves as a Virginian, a uh, Marylander, uh, or maybe even a Louisianian first, before being uh, an American. We don't have a, many night reenactments. Uh, one of the reasons, in addition to the fact that it's authentic, one of the other reasons why we do the night battle is so people can see the flare of the guns. In a the day, they see white smoke coming out of muskets. Here, they see the red flare of the cannons and the guns, so it's much more attractive visual for the audience. Uh, we also do this to to remind people of St. Bernard Parish's important role in American history. One of the most uh, significant battles in American history is fought in St. Bernard Parish, and we're very proud of, to have that distinction. I've always been fascinated uh, by uh, reenacting my, my whole life. Um, I suppose it was because being uh, enthralled by uh, everything military, particularly uh, everything of the 18th and 19th century, the idea that you can actually participate in a small way in recreating this and reliving this period rather than just reading about it in a book uh, was so exciting to me. So I've been doing this now for, gosh, I hate to say this, nearly 40 years. Um, I started this very young. <laughs> I actually like it when it's, uh, you know, when we reenact obviously events that actually occurred in the places they occurred and, uh, you know, reflecting upon uh, the events that occurred on a particular field of battle, you know, at a given time, uh, plus the camaraderie amongst the, the, the fellows that I'm with. I'm part of the uh, 7th U.S. Infantry, uh, U.S. Infantry Living History Association, you know, we're, we're a group of reenactors that are spread pretty much throughout the uh, central and eastern United States, doing primarily War of 1812 and uh, up into the 1830s and uh, mechs war in the 1850s. For uh, those of you that are in and around the area, certainly take a little bit of time, uh, you know, during uh, the early part of January of uh, any given year to come out and see uh, the true history of New Orleans. See where the uh, city of New Orleans was saved uh, from the invading British in 1815. We have several of our artists and crafters out here so people could kind of browse around, do a little shopping, get some information before they head over to the battlefield. I do a lot of local St. Bernard Parish art, some of um, the old landmarks, some things that were actually destroyed in Katrina and trying to kind of bring back some of those memories and um, some of the, the more famous uh, landmarks. I have um, 
a painting, a, a print from the painting of the Borgard House and the um, Shelmet Battlefield that um, where, where the Battle of New Orleans took place. I have one nighttime painting and one daytime painting. And I also have a floor de lis of the monument in the different towns and such in St. Bernard Parish. When you pull up uh, on the battlefield, you will see over 150 Living History volunteers um, with the British encampment and the American encampment. There'll be weapon firing, cannons going off, so brace yourself because that just happens periodically. And it's actually the lifestyle of the people who won that magnificent battle back in 1815. On one side of the field we have General Andrew Jackson and the American troops, which range from regular army to free men of color to militias from Tennessee and Kentucky, the Choctaw Indians and Baratarian pirates. Behind me is, are the British troops led by General Pakenham and they have invaded and are hoping to strike a blow at the, at the Republic and take the city of New Orleans. New Orleans was the port that brought everything from the heartland of America, furs, food, lumber, all those uh, supplies, uh, brought it down the river and then it was dispersed to the rest of the world and the East Coast. So if you could take New Orleans, just like today, the Mississippi River was a highway, and if you could take New Orleans, you could control the economic power of the center of the United States. It's important because you know, we, we like to say sometimes that the War of 1812 was a forgotten war. We all remember 1776 and the Revolution, but back in, back in the day, democracy was still kind of a crazy idea. That was still a very untried idea. Europe was still being governed by kings. And so the fact that people in the United States were able to work together, put aside any regional or class or racial or whatever differences, work together against a common foe and defeat the British, brought us great respect and made us a real player on the world stage. We are representing a unit of the Tennessee militia under Andrew Jackson's command here at the battle and what you just saw was an example of volley firing or firing by the units which was done on line Jackson in, in a large amount during about a 30 minute period during, during the battle and typically this is how line infantry units are, are trained to load and fire is essentially one machine like operation. The individual is not the weapon. A unit of about four to five hundred men, the battalion or the regiment is the real weapon on the battlefield and we want to function and it's very important that we function as, as one solid mass. The type of weapons we're using are called the Model 1795 military musket. It's the first United States produced military firearm. It was the musket of the War of 1812 used by United States forces. And essentially it is very similar to other weapons used on this battlefield. It's, uh, it's a smoothbore flintlock musket. When the trigger is pulled, a piece of rock called flint strikes a hammer, creates sparks. The sparks fall into a little bit of black powder, create an explosion which sends fire into the barrel, which creates a larger explosion which launches lead projectile or projectiles out the end of the barrel. And the, the typical maximum effective range of a, of a weapon of this nature is about 100 yards. For best effect, they might want to fire at, at well less than half of that, at around the 50 yard or less. And the weapons, even though by our standards today are very primitive, it's a very uh, effective, simple, and deadly technology. Why is it important that uh, people uh, relive and understand and appreciate this history? Well, we're always in the, in the, the threat of forgetting our past, I, I think. And so something like a, a living history program like this brings the elements to life that, that we don't learn in school. We, we learn maybe the, the times, the dates, the names of people, and the, the, the larger event. But something like this puts us in touch with the details that the textbooks can't teach us. You know, what does the campfire smell like? What, what is the, the sight, sound, and smell of, of a musket being fired? What are the uniforms that, that men wore back then? You know, what are they made out of? Wool. What is, what is linen really like? We, we hear about linen, but, but what is linen? And uh, it, 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 gives, it gives our senses something to, uh, to experience, which in the classroom, we, we just don't have that opportunity. I represent the 43rd Monmouthshire Light Infantry Regiment. 
the demonstration we did here today is uh, a demonstration of the light infantry drill. Um, the 43rd is not, or at the time was not, a regular infantry um, regiment in, in that they fought shoulder to shoulder uh, along a line. We actually went into a skirmish line. Each man paired off with another man and they fought as a team scooting and shooting trying to um, lure the enemy into combat into a favorable position for the British side so the regular uh, infantry could face them at a better advantage. Uh, once that was accomplished the light infantry uh, withdrew and became uh, ready reserves to plug up any holes or to outflank the enemy. Because they were light infantry, they could run. Uh, we carry smaller weapons, lighter weapons. Uh, it's, uh, it's generally a lot more fun <laughs> to, to scoot and shoot along the battlefield uh, than to, to march around uh, at a slow pace. The color of the British uniform, red, oh dates back to Oliver Cromwell's new model army of the English Civil War, 1642. When Cromwell created his army, he decided that he had to be uniform so that on the battlefield, all of his troops would know who was on their side and who wasn't. Initially, all they'd worn is a sash, crimson for the king and orange for parliament. Now, the thing to do is to wear a red coat because the dye for, for dyeing a coat red is cheap and can be produced in great numbers. Uh, after the end of the Civil War with the return of the King, Charles II, after of course the Commonwealth of uh, Cromwell, the tradition was continued of wearing a red coat. You will notice that the privates of the army wear a dark red coat, whereas the officers wear a scarlet coat. This distinguishes them on the field. Every army has its own distinctive color, so that they can tell friend from foe at a distance. I'm General Andrew Jackson. I've been asked this question by a lot of the populace here since I've been camped. This is Lyme Jackson over here on my left. It's built out of mud that's been dredged out of a drainage ditch there from the Mississippi River to the swamp. The reason I've built this press work here the way I have is because I want to make sure the British have to come to my army. I want them to come straight to me rather than me have to come to them. I learned that hunting as a boy back in North Carolina. You make the game come to you. And that's what I'm expecting to happen here. I have Tennessee militia on my left flank at the moment. I have the 44th United States Infantry. I have the 7th United States Infantry and also Plauchet's Home Guard, which is a French regiment here that serve a home guard in New Orleans. They're going to join my force and about 700 Choctaw Indians. The rest is militia from Tennessee. Perhaps uh, I have General Carroll's militia, riflemen from Tennessee. And also General Adair is going to be commanding somewhere around 100, maybe 200 men from Kentucky in the center of our line there with a the long gun. So I think with these men placed the way they are, and with men guarding the levee road that leads into New Orleans, the way I'm going to have it guarded with a gun port built up there, that the British will find that coming here to take this land again may not be quite as easy to do as what they thought it was. The strategic importance to the, to the British and the Americans for two different reasons to the British is the fact if they can capture the mouth of the Mississippi River, you see, they never, they never left England whenever the War of Independence was over. The English never left Canada. They still occupy Canada and control Canada yet here in 1815. Now, the thing is, if they can control the mouth of the Mississippi, if they can control that river, they can cut our nation in half. They have a waterway that they can travel all the way back and forth to Canada, from the Gulf into Canada. And we have the Louisiana Purchase, as I'm sure, sir, you know there, that was purchased for $12 million by, by President Jefferson from uh, Napoleon Bonaparte they would control that as well because their waterway, this waterway would make it possible for them to control both halves of our nation. And that's very strategic to them. If they did that, they could control our commerce because their navy is the most powerful navy in the world. So they control the high seas, they control Canada, and if they control this waterway, they could control the United States. We would be like fish in a barrel, as it were.
I represent a sailor off the USS Carolina, which is one of the two Navy ships out in the Mississippi River. The Carolina sank first after it was holed by hot shot from the British guns. We all swam across, and because we didn't have any jobs to do, they sent us on a 32-pound artillery piece, which was on battery number four, which is right behind us. The 32-pounder tore gaping holes in the British line as they approached uh, Line Jackson. Uh, in fact, the very first uh, round that was fired out of the gun was basically 12 pounds of black powder and about 1,000 musket balls. Well, my role here at the battle is actually uh, as a Native American, uh, and what I've tried to do is to show exactly what a Native American uh, in uh, 1814 uh, living around New Orleans would have looked like and this is what we would look like. Uh, my, my role is also part of my, my family because my family fought here. Uh, quite a few of my family, uh, the Homa were here and the Choctaw were both here and the, uh, some of the Homas actually fought with the feet and brought, were brought in with the feet and so uh, at that point uh, this is the way you would have dressed because you were pretty much decked out about like the feet would have been decked out. Um, but the Native American, as far as in this battle, we had a big role because not only did we know the territory very well, uh, they also used us as scouts and they also uh, uh, used us as interpreters because a lot of Native Americans can speak, speak multiple, 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 different languages, multiple language. And, um, so they knew how to speak a language called Mobilian, but they could also speak English, they could also speak French, uh, and a few other different languages. So they could go from one line to the other and they could understand, which on this line, at, during this battle, you had so many people that were fighting in this battle that couldn't speak English, uh, maybe only spoke Creole, maybe only spoke French, uh, some of them only spoke English. So it was good to have some certain people that could go from one line to the other. Uh, also, too, like I said, the, the, uh, with the Native American here, you also had uh, um, the ones that were with Lafitte uh, were brought in to help him, but to also bring in the cannons that were needed and a lot of other things that were needed. So that's why I'm dressed the way I am, to show people that here in Louisiana at that time, in that time period, uh, we were dressing uh, pretty much the same way as anybody else dressed, in fact, sometimes even fancier. I am a free man of color on the United States side. We fight against the British, and the, the reason why we are fighting for is free trade and sailors' rights, parts of Canada, and the, uh, the Mississippi River, because we need that to trade stuff. And if we don't have that, uh, we couldn't have any money. We played the soldiers fighting against the British, so they wouldn't come over and um, take our town over and turn us into slaves. been fascinated learning little facts since I was born here. I never knew little details that I learned about today. Why is it important people remember this history? I think it gives us a sense of our culture and our history, especially as a New Orleanian and somebody who who has just lived there all of our lives to know that something so memorable took place in this community, right in our backyards. It's really good. I've been really impressed with everybody in their uniforms and the accents they do and it makes you really think like you're at the War of 1812. I'd say important a part of our history and to know you know what parts of what countries um, were involved in it and how New Orleans was settled and 
the importance of this day? I saw lots of things. I saw the there was two men dressed up as British soldiers. They were playing the flute and playing the drums. And I kind of liked the way they were playing because most people don't play the drums or flute like that anymore. Now they're playing more essential type music that follows what we like instead of things that they don't do anymore back then. So I thought that was pretty cool. The uh, military uniforms, that's what impressed me the most is the, uh, the periodic of the uniforms. The insignias on them. I, I like all that. I'm into military uh, history and stuff like that. I think it's an important thing to know why uh, why this is this is part of the reason why we're a free nation is because we fought this war so long ago and we uh, you know we got uh, we got a treaty with them. It's the realism, getting to see what they would be doing, playing the cards that they had, the games that they had, cooking, you know, them in costume. It's neat the way they stay in their period and tell you who they were coming down from wherever they came down from and why they did the things that they did. It's fun. It's a huge part of history. I mean, Louisiana, Shaman in particular, is so rich with history. People don't even realize it's in our own backyard. And it was important to, the, to our country. It's hard to pick which part was my favorite. Um, I liked it all, but uh, just getting general information from everyone who was here uh, participating was really, uh, I guess, my favorite. I think everyone needs to know the important uh, part that that um, of, of history was played out here in Shalmat, and um, and also to um, help Shalmat grow. It's it's um, after Katrina, uh, we, we we need to have uh, more uh, participation from the rest of the nation to come down and see what we have. My favorite part was um, being out here today, nice day, and seeing everybody dressed up and uh, learning about the history. I enjoy talking to the reenactors. Uh, I love history and I've, I've uh, been in the process of building the flintlock rifle myself for a, quite a while. And I talked to them in uh, getting some information on firing the weapons and, and some of the stuff they do as reenactors. Uh, most of them have been in it for a long time. They're very knowledgeable about what they do. They, uh, they have very good period costumes. And I, I, uh, they're just regular folks that enjoy history also, so I enjoy talking to them and, and uh, gaining from their experience. And tell us about the event tonight. Tonight. Tonight is the coolest event. It is, not many people know about it. It is kind of exclusive because it's a ticketed event, but tickets go on sale for this event in December. So if you haven't been, look for the National Park Service website for when they go on sale. It's called the Lantern Tour. And uh, same as before, you come to the visitor center to be shuttled over, but they take you in groups of, um, small groups of maybe 10 to 15. And you are, uh, you are routed through the park at night by lantern, like you are stepping back in that period as a third person, not even there. You are like a ghost person, but you're overhearing the plotting of the generals, planning their strategies. You're uh, overhearing the conversation around the campfires. Uh, you might have a random soldier jump out of the bushes with a bayonet. It's just very exciting, very different, and it, it's very intriguing to be there on the battlefield at night. What's the, the best part of this uh, entire experience? The best part for us is, I think, that the fact that this was such a significant battle. And it has kind of, um, I don't know how, got superseded by other important battles that have happened in our lifetime. Um, the Civil War, for in instance. So a lot of people know the history of the Civil War, but they don't know about this American war that if would not have won, we, I, I jokingly say, we'd all be speaking the, the Queen's English. It would have turned the period in history around. So for us to be able, especially with the 200 year anniversary coming up of the Battle of New Orleans, the whole significance was the British wanted control of the Mississippi River. And the ragtag Americans, you know, drew up, strengthened up, and, and defeated this elite British army. And, and it is a magnificent story, and uh, we hope people that come will learn and not have forgotten that, that the people who lost their lives to protect our newly fledgling American spirit. If people like more information and want to come for uh, 2013, what should they do? 2013, well, um, they can look in their calendar, call, our, of course, our visitor information, um, uh, 800, uh, 278 2054 is our toll free, but um, or our website visitsaintbernard.com. But if they look at their calendar, 
2013 and they look at the weekend closest to the January 8th, they know that's when it's going to be.